So we have a good crowd already, so we'll go ahead and dive in. We don't want to cut your time too short. Um, thank you again, Lacey, for joining us and sharing your amazing work. Um, just a brief introduction. Lacey brings her passion for supporting healthy kids, thriving communities, and sustainable food systems to her work as a farm to early care and education associate with the National Farm to School Network. In her work at NSSN, Lacey works to promote the development and expansion of the farm to early care and education movement through information sharing, network building, and advocacy. Lacey coordinates the NSSN Farm to Early Care and Education Working Group serves on the CACSP National Advisory Council and CACSP TA work group and holds a chair position with the Hunger and Environmental Nutrition Dietetics Practice Group. And the floor is yours, Lacey, and thanks again. Great. Thank you, Kim, for that introduction. Um, and thanks, everyone, for being here. I'm really eager to be able to share with you the work of the National Farm to School Network. And um, so I'll be sharing a little bit about who we are and what we do as an organization, and then dive into what is Farm to Early Care and Education, and, and why is it a promising strategy for health and wellness for our youngest eaters here. Um, and then hopefully we'll have some time for discussion as well, because I uh, would value your feedback on some issues that we face as an organization and uh, ideas that we brought back or that I brought back from the convening and we'll love to touch base and, and regroup on that. So uh, I'm looking forward to sharing our work and getting your feedback as well. Let's see if I can move my slides forward here. There we go. Um, so again, my name is Lacey Stevens. I'm the Farm to Early Care and Education Associate with the National Farm to School Network. I'm based um, in Bozeman, Montana. Um, where I completed my dietetic internship as well as my master's degree in sustainable food systems. Uh, so I work at the national level, but I get to stay in the midst of these lovely mountains here in Montana. Um, so there's my contact information. Please reach out at any time. And of course, I value staying connected with you through Mighty Bell and our other opportunities there, too. So I'll start with just a brief introduction to our organization, the National Farm to School Network. Um, and as you, as you can see by this depiction, we really are united as a network, and it's the basis of our organization. So in addition to um, our national staff, including myself, we also have an advisory board who helps guide our work um, and, and strategic plan and visioning. So those are kind of the core of our, of our organization. In addition to those, we contract with eight regional lead agencies across the country. And you can see how those regional regions are divided up there. Um, within each of those regions, we have a regional lead who is our contact um, and really guiding and um, both sharing information to us from what's happening on the ground in that region and disseminating your information from the national level to their contacts um, and their states within their region. So in addition to those eight regional leads, we also have a contact person within each state, our state leads. And those state leads are really the folks on the ground doing the work in the schools and early care and education settings uh, in state agencies or non-for-profits do not have that direct connectivity to what's happening on the ground when it comes to farm to school and farm to early care and education. So in addition to what we call our core partners, which are those state and regional leads, we also have a network of now, this has grown since this last has been updated, but more than 14,000 network members who sign up with us to receive our monthly newsletters, connect with us through social media, um, are active in some way in the farm to school or farm to early care um, movement, or just have great interest and want to work within their own communities to stay connected with us at the national level as a member of our network. So we have all of these folks and really build and capitalize on this network to be that leading and guiding voice in farm to school and farm to early care and education. Um, and although, as I'll talk about and continue to discuss, farm to school and farm to early care and education is very much a grassroots community-based movement, we recognize the need for a national voice around this movement to help create guidance and leadership and advocacy efforts to promote and create opportunity across the country and in communities across the country. So that's really our goal as an organization, is to be that leading and guiding voice to create more opportunity for communities to bring in local food and food and farm-based education. And we do that with the basis of this network. And our aim is to utilize that network to act as a hub for information, networking, and advocacy. So in sum, we really look to, for opportunity to connect people to resources, people to people, and people to policy. 
So when it comes to information, um, just in the realm of early care and education, which is my specific focus area, we do a lot of work in identifying the best resources that are out there, whether that's curricula that can be implemented in the classroom, whether that's information about building a state-level network, or whether that's um, peer-reviewed literature and research about the work around bond to early care and education. We have an amazing resource database that is very accessible and easily searchable. Uh, we have a beautiful website with a lot of resources. We have a lot of those communication channels that are constantly sharing out the information. And we're also gathering information and resources from all of those partners and all of those members. So that's the connection of information um, and the connection from people to resources. And then, of course, networking is naturally a huge part of what we do. Uh, so in the farm to early care and education realm, I can be in a number of national level networks and working groups focused on research, focused on embedding cultural relevancy in the farm to early care and education movement, and uh, general working groups focused on building connectivity between farm to school stakeholders and early care and education stakeholders uh, and food system stakeholders, and really building those national networks of partners um, to help facilitate the institutionalization and the continuation of farm to early care and education. So we build those national level networks, and then we constantly work to support our partners in different states to help them build their own networks at the state level. So a lot of my focus is in helping to build a shared language around farm to early care and education that both early care and education stakeholders and our farm to school stakeholders can understand and come together around. So that's part of that network building component. And then finally, the advocacy piece. We have a fantastic team working in Washington, D.C., focusing on federal level advocacy and policy. So, of course, there's a strong emphasis on child nutrition reauthorization right now um, and the Farm to School Act as part of that. So we're working at the federal level. But in addition, we're also looking to provide support um, and, and increased capacity for our partners to work at the, both the state and local level. Um, so whether that's uh, looking for opportunities to change or support new policies and new legislation, or looking at how we can capitalize and leverage existing legislation or policies to support and build capacity for farm to school and farm to early care and education. We look at multiple opportunities in that advocacy bucket. So that's a little bit about what our network is and how we aim to be that leading and guiding voice around farm to school and farm to early care and education. So now that I've been kind of throwing this language around, we're going to dig in a little bit deeper to what is farm to early care and education. So at its root, farm to early care and education is a group of strategies and activities that connect children to increase access to healthy local foods, gardening opportunities, and food-based activities. So there's not one specific farm to early care and education program that program or that early care and education settings are expected to subscribe to, but it's this whole array of options and activities uh, and initiatives that can fit into these three different buckets, all based around food and connecting children and their families to high quality local food access. Um, so as I mentioned, this is really, uh, for each, each early care and education setting, it looks very unique. Farm to early care and education looks different and unique in each setting. And it's really based on the interests and capacities of each setting and each community um, and what really resonates with those individuals that can really um, create, start to create that connection between children and high quality food. So with early care and education, we're looking at targeting, targeting children and their families ages 0 to 5 um, in multiple types of settings. So whether that's a family child care home, or a Head Start, or a preschool, or a child care center, we look at all of these places and opportunities that we can connect with children and their families and provide them these opportunities. So here's just another general visualization of what those core elements we call from farm to school or farm to early care and education. Um, so as I mentioned, it might be one of these elements. There might just be starting out with a school garden or maybe starting out with one local snack. And that's still doing farm to early care and education, even one piece. But the all pieces are built to work together. So if a child is growing a carrot in the ground in their garden, they're going to be much more likely to go into the meal time and more likely to try those carrots once they see them on the plate because they know where they've come from and they've connected with how they've grown. And the education piece also feeds into that. You know, when a child has that experiential opportunity to taste test different kinds of broccoli or taste test different colors of peppers, they're going to be a lot more likely to go into snack time um, and eat those different peppers uh, 
instead of being uh, weirded out or afraid of them. That comfort level increases as these multiple exposures increase through these various elements. So now just a sneak peek of what these look like directly in the classroom. Um, so education can be multiple aspects and multiple opportunities, from reading books to having cooking activities and taste tests and special visitors. And even the youngest little ones can get involved in these edu educational activities with sensory exploration of fruits and vegetables, like these little guys are exploring um, those apples with their mouths and their hands. And then as children get older and get more prepared for uh, going into kindergarten, we have opportunities to do more food-based lessons, talking about where food grows, how it, how it grows, and where it comes from, and, and connecting kids with their food system and helping them gain understanding of that bigger picture. And we can also tie in local foods into our existing curricula and academic goals. So thinking about how can we integrate a local pumpkin into math class? What's the circumference of the pumpkin? Can we count the seeds? Um, is that apple going to float or sink when we think about the science and experimental options? Um, so there's lots of ways to meet those early learning standards with food-based activities in education. Gardening is another strong component that ties into that educational piece. Um, and I think a lot of programs see gardening as this um, kind of first step in getting into farm to early parent education, that direct experiential um, opportunity ties in so closely with um, the work and the opportunities of a parent in early care and education. And we have lots of different ways that we can experience gardening with these little ones. So we can have those in the ground beds if there's plenty of room, but we can also have a few pots next to the house or on the windowsill. We have raised beds, uh, indoor aquaponics, or vertical gardening, even just planting a seed in the cot offers that experiential connection where kids can see uh, where their food is growing and make that connection in their head about what they're eating and where it comes from. And then that third element that we talked about is the local foods or the procurement. Actually getting the farm fresh uh, foods, whether that's produce, meat, eggs, beans, dairy, any of the foods that might come into the CACFP or early care and education program, into meals, snacks, and taste tests. And we have unique opportunities for local foods in the early care and education setting that make it a bit unique from the K-12 challenges. Um, and so we do have such diverse opportunities in early care and education. We know how different all of these programs are, um, which creates a lot of opportunity for, for um, adapting to different opportunities within the community food system. So early care and education programs have a variety of classes and program sizes, so that can be more adept to some of the smaller community and family farmers who maybe not, don't have the volume to provide food for the K-12 programs, but have a really valuable opportunity to provide the correct volume and amount for early care and education program. Many early care education programs are also going year-round, so you can capitalize on that seasonality. Um, and local foods connect with the early care education priority areas, thinking about food as an experiential learning opportunity. And then the family-style meals as well, create every meal as, as a learning um, time, as a lesson time, to talk about where the foods that are on our plate are coming from. How can we experience this and celebrate it together in those family-style meals? And then we have this continued support from CACFP. Um, the new CACFP meal guidelines, those best practice that accompany the CACFP guidelines, highlight local and seasonal foods as a best practice in supporting success in CACFP, uh, which is the Child and Adult Care Food Program, for those of you who might not be familiar. Um, and that's a federally funded program that provides meals and snacks for early care and education settings and other settings as well. So now we have kind of a sneak peek into what is farm to early care and education, what do those pieces look like, I'll really jump into the big why. Why is this important for children? Why is this important for families and communities? So farm to school for any age, whether we're talking preschool, um, early care and education settings, all the way up through college, we see this as a triple win. So kids are learning with those educational opportunities and the health benefits, becoming better stewards of their environment and understanding their food system. Farmers are winning with new markets and increased, um, increased and higher variety in their markets. And communities win from public health aspects, 
uh, people have a greater understanding where their food's coming from and they're connected to their local food system to economic benefits. We continually see uh, research coming out about how investing in your local businesses and local economies can resonate with economic, increased economic activity and environmental benefits. Um, so thinking about where food is coming from as a purchaser, you can make decisions about how that food is grown and what your priorities are. So this is um, great benefits, this triple win for any kind of farm to school for any age. But when we're thinking about younger children, when we're thinking about the early care and education setting, we have a lot of additional benefits that we can capitalize on. And a lot of those additional benefits naturally align with the priorities and the goals of early care and education community. So thinking about increased family and community engagement, the educational hands-on experiences, and of course health and wellness as a major priority. So with family and community engagement, we know that uh, with these little ones, parents are naturally more engaged, and programs like Head Start create that as a priority and a requirement. But to increase family and parent engagement, parents really look for those opportunities for hands-on uh, engagement. Just like kids need that experience of practicing things and having the experiential learning, parents appreciate that as well and are more likely to engage and follow through with engagement when we're working on those hands-on experiential activities, um, like food and gardening and cooking together as a family. We also know that children are major agents of, agents of change in the household. So if a little one goes home and is requesting strawberries or requesting cherry tomatoes, mom and dad or caregivers are going to be a lot more likely to purchase those foods uh, because they know they won't go to the waste. And they know two kids will eat them and the whole family gets the benefit of experiencing them and having those changes within the home. In addition to uh, engaging families and changing things within the home, caregivers are also uh, influenced. So when caregivers have the opportunity to be exposed to new foods and their ideas about new foods are expanded, they have a better opportunity to model those positive attitudes. And we know how vital that modeling and that positive talk is uh, for caregivers and for families. Again, we see this great opportunity with an enhanced educational experience. And these little ones are naturally working on experiential education, those hands-on experiences, utilizing all of their senses to learn about the world. And that's just supporting appropriate cognitive, physical, social, and emotional development through these hands-on activities and experiences. And further, they, a lot of these experiences naturally align with state early learning standards, Head Start program performance standards, and can support providers in meeting these standards while providing those multiple benefits of food exposures and increased access to healthy food. And of course, that's a major priority in health and wellness. We know that um, these little ones' taste preferences are developing at this young age, and it's a vital time to have those multiple exposures and those multiple opportunities to try new healthy foods. Um, we're getting increased research as we look at farm to early care education programs about how they're influencing children's willingness to like and try um, and eat more fruits and vegetables and unfamiliar foods as they gain familiarity. And again, in these uh, early years, we have an opportunity to really control the food environment around the young ones. Um, you know, it's not, it's not too many years until they can run to the corner store and start buying candy bars or have access to that a la carte uh, menu at K through 12 schools. So this is an important time to help um, when we have access to control that environment to make it the best possible food environment. And as we influence parents and caregivers' knowledge and their choices around food, we can create a wholly supportive environment that supports those choices and allows children to create and cultivate those healthy habits for lifelong better choices um, and healthier lifestyles. So that's a little bit about why this is so vital and why we're working so hard to expand these opportunities to communities across the country. So I'll briefly touch on one of our newest resources, um, which is a full report from the survey of early care education providers that we conducted last fall. Um, and I'll give a brief overview of some of our high-level responses from our survey respondents. And this is all accessible at the National Farm to School Network online on our website. Um, and I believe that we'll have all of these resources posted on Mighty Bell as well. So from this survey that we conducted, we had um, nearly 1,500 providers respond. And those 1,500 
providers are serving over 183,000 children across the country. We got respondents from 49 states and Washington, D.C. Um, interesting enough, almost more than half, 54 percent, are already integrating these farm to early care and education activities, and another 28 percent plan to do so in the future. So we have a lot of great interest. We have a lot of great um, potential for people who are recognizing the value of these opportunities and are looking for resources and options in implementing them. So a few of our key findings, as I mentioned, over 54% of respondents in 48 states in Washington, D.C. are already participating in these types of activities. Um, and that's, we, this is a continuation or a second survey based on an earlier 2012 survey. From that 2012 survey, respondents, um, we had about 450 respondents who confirmed they were doing farm to early care and education activities in 39 states. So we can see that growth from 39 states to 48 states and from um, about 450 providers to over 800 providers who confirmed participating in these activities. So we see abundant growth and opportunity in this area. And we have this finance from all types of sites, from child care centers to family child care homes to private peace schools to Head Start. So we know that these kind of activities can fit well into early care, any early care and education thing. And in addition to that, almost a third of the sites with farm to early care and education activities reported that their um, enrollment was accounted for by over three quarters of low-income children and families. So we know that these um, early care education activities are taking place in all kinds of communities and really helping to serve and improve food access for low-income children and their families at the same time. You know, one of the biggest things that struck us from the survey is why providers are choosing to do the farm to early care and education. Um, and the top three, as you can see here, we're helping children understand where their food comes from, which is a natural fit. But more importantly, thinking about how it improves children's health and it provides children with those experiential learning opportunities. So again, really paralleling those priorities from the early care and education community. So I do have some discussion questions that we can go into later, but I'd love to pause for questions if anyone has questions at this time or anything you'd like me to expand on or, or any points of discussion. Okay, I don't see any questions yet, but um, again, feel free to reach out to me. Um, that's my contact information. Um, and we'll see how much discussion we can get going. I know it's a little bit challenging on a webinar. Oh, we have one in. Okay, here we go. Does Farmer School have any resources about mental health or socioeconomic outcomes? This is a great question and definitely something we're interested in pursuing. I'll actually be going to some meetings um, in the next couple of weeks about research opportunities and research agenda, and that's definitely an area that we're focusing in. I think that we do see some research um, around particularly mental health associated with gardening activities in particular. Um, so that's certainly one strong component of Farm to School and Farm to Early Care and Education that does some of that research-based information about mental health. Um, I'd have to say that for the most part, most of that mental health and socioeconomic, or excuse me, socio mental, socio emotional um, outcomes are primarily anecdotal at this point. Um, I think there's definitely a strong push to get more of that research-based work. Um, and the National Friends of School Network has developed a um, framework for evaluation that does um, increase or incorporate some of those um, mental health and socio emotional. Um, outcomes. Unfortunately, it just hasn't been implemented at the scale that we'd like to see. Um, so that's definitely a future direction of research that we would love to see expanded. Um, next question we have, have you seen families request opportunities for affordable food um, and plans to expand resources to allow families to access affordable food? Um, yeah, I think that that is a, a resonating request and a continual challenge. Um, people do automatically assume that purchasing locally is more expensive and purchasing fresh is more expensive. 
expensive, which it certainly can be, but I think that's where a lot of educational opportunities come in um, and a lot of bridge building between local food systems and providers. And we do see a lot of really creative approaches to supporting families and accessing higher quality foods and supporting early care and education programs and accessing higher quality foods. Um, and there are a lot of really wonderful examples um, around the country. So for instance, there's a program in um, Pennsylvania that is, is utilizing um, a grant support to connect with their local food hub. So the grant support provides um, a supplemental portion of the food boxes, so the CSA, Community Supported Agriculture. This grant support provides a supplemental amount of that cost so that families can access those food boxes for a limited amount. Um, so there's some wonderful projects happening there, and then families have the opportunity to learn about the foods, um, to gain demand for those foods, and then they can build connectivity within the local food system to further um, those access opportunities. So it really comes down to kind of community-based approaches to connecting families and programs with their local food system to help increase that affordability. Um, and there's so many policy aspects that we can look at, too. Um, certainly, you know, child and adult care food program is a great way to help early care education programs um, mediate that cost. If they're getting reimbursement for food, they're going to be able to afford a little bit more. Um, so that's one great access point and leverage point for allowing programs to um, access different and higher quality foods. Um, and so there are definitely a lot of wonderful community-based approaches um, to increasing that access and affordability, but it certainly is, continues to be a challenge. Um, and that's why that family engagement is so important around the education piece as well, helping parents and families understand how to use these foods, uh, because quite often, and even if we're not thinking about uh, baseline costs for fresh products, there's also the, um, the cost associated with time. There's also costs associated with the investment and ability to cook the foods and put the time into preparation. So that's where we can really see um, changes in that um, cost balance as well, is helping people learn to affordably purchase foods as well as fix them in a manner that they enjoy and is going to keep them going back. Okay, uh, next question. Are there plans to expand family engagement approaches? Um, you know, that's a great question and it's very, you know, as I mentioned, we're working at the national level to help provide um, access and information and it's definitely an area that we would like to see increased expansion in. And we have some wonderful examples as I mentioned. Uh, you know, there are programs across the country that are offering um, job training and education to families in kitchens. There's opportunities for families to um, do field trips together. There's opportunities for families to work in the garden together and have garden plots where they can access those foods as well as work together in the garden. So, um, you know, it's certainly something we're looking at how to best maximize those family engagement approaches because it can be very challenging when you're working in, in communities where, um, you know, maybe mom and dad are absent and grandma's taking care of little ones. Or maybe mom and dad both have two jobs, and it's just a challenge to make that extra time. So there's other creative approaches as well. So you know, in Head Start, which requires a certain amount of, of family time investment, uh, some programs are creating opportunities for parents to take home the garden fresh produce and cook that in their own home, and that counts as their time committed to the program. So some of those creative ways to get families involved and make it more accustomed to their time frame and their capacity. How much is starting a site on the program is done with person-to-person -person mentoring and how much is just online? Um, so this is totally dependent on what an individual, what um, an early transportation site is interested in. Um, you know, quite often we have programs, we have, uh, you know, a champion emerges from a program and they're willing to do some of that research, some of that leg, some of that leg work finding out what the opportunities in their community are um, and, and, and they kind of emerge as that champion to lead the way. Um, sometimes programs are a part of like a state level program. So many states have many grant programs or many states have outreach from the state level and an early care and education site can get involved in that and then they get a little more direct person-to-person -person contact and individual support. So again, it really depends on the capacity and the interest and in what's accessible in the community. So from our perspective, from the National Farm School Network, 
we of course try to provide information that is disseminated through our channels. Um, so through our multiple channels of social media, um, our individual state and regional leads, um, and, and then our newsletters, all those different channels we provide information to and of course have accessible information on our website. And people certainly reach out to me individually as well and I'm always happy to provide that information. Um, but of course what works best is connecting people with your local community. So that's always what I try to do as well is help people build those connections in their local community. So I think that um, depending on an individual and a program's capacity and interest, it can really be done either way. You know, can, you can really take this and roll with it and make it your own. Or you can build those connections and those facilitations in your community. Let's see. Do you see a difference in healthy eating? Difference in healthy eating habits at home connected to the work you did with children, and how did you measure this? Um, so I haven't done any direct research. We do have several research um, papers looking at that, not directly in the early care education programs. Most of the research around this work is really based in K through 12. Um, and we're just starting to see expansion in research in the early care and education sites. Um, so I will also share on the uh, Mighty Bell site our benefits from farm to school fact sheet, which is kind of a literature review of the literature that we see coming out around farm to early care and education and farm to school specifically. Um, so within the farm to school realm, there is uh, several research studies indicating a change in eating habits at home with families. Um, and that's primarily looked at through purchasing. Um, so I guess it's less directly eating habits, but purchasing habits that are changing within the home is the research that I've seen. Um, so that's what I know of now, and again, as I mentioned, we have a lot of opportunities for expanded research in this area to get more of that evidentiary support. Who or what has been the most innovative or unexpected partnership to date? Are communities around the country accessing the network to connect with other farm to school communities to learn from each other? Um, so speaking about the network, absolutely. Um, you know, that's really a lot of our goal in building the network. Um, so we see these multiple levels of connectivity. So many of our state and our regional leads um, connect with one another, as well as building state level connections to build these kind of shared learning communities. Um, and then at the national level, we do like to provide multiple opportunities for connectivity and shared learning. So one of the biggest opportunities is our farm to cafeteria um, conference that we have every other year. So that's one major in-person opportunity to share resources and information. And then we also have other smaller opportunities. I host uh, quarterly webinars where programs share out information and their knowledge. Our um, website is frequently featuring new blogs and highlights of new programs and lessons learned. Um, so we have that kind of national level network building. And then we're also providing support for our state leads who are doing multiple opportunities um, to create those shared learning environments. Um, and some of the most successful uh, programs that I've seen are really based on that shared learning model. Um, so one example in Minnesota, they have a fantastic program for family child care providers, uh, where they do a training session with the family child care providers, but then those child care providers meet uh, once a week to talk about their successes and their challenges in implementing new education opportunities and implementing new um, new foods and new curricula. So they have that ongoing support, which really builds a lot of longevity um, and, and shared success. So uh, those are some of the most innovative opportunities that I've seen is building those, those learning communities. Let's think about the most innovative or unexpected partnerships. Um, so I think, you know, one of, and this isn't necessarily unexpected, but I think that's one that could certainly be capitalized and is of a lot of interest, is the connectivity between early care and education programs and senior feeding programs. Um, I think looking at that intergenerational opportunity for learning and, um, you know, bringing in experience from those seniors, and then also having that shared resource, because a lot of senior feeding programs are working on a different time schedule than the early care education program. So capitalizing and maximizing uh, those physical resources as well as the, the human resources of those experienced seniors and connecting them to these little ones is so multi-beneficial. Um, so I think that that's one of the most exciting innovations that we can see coming up. 
So how do ECE providers manage the gardens and the curriculum? Um, again, this is really individual to the program. And we always encourage programs uh, to start small. You know, start with something that's going to be manageable. Um, so a lot of times that's very small containers. And uh, people need to know what they're getting into with a garden, to know that it's not going to take care of itself. And that's why it's always a good idea to start small. But I think really uh, the opportunity is to integrate both the gardening and the curriculum into what programs are already doing. Um, so most early education programs are required to have a curriculum. Um, one option is, say, a creative curriculum, where there's lots of opportunity and flexibility to integrate different kinds of activities. And from a lot of the um, kind of set and determined curriculum around farm to early care education that's been established, you can see the, the learning standards that are being met laid out within the curriculum. So it makes it really easy for providers to kind of fit that into their existing plans and to the existing parts of their day. Um, so that's one goal, is to really make sure that um, this curriculum, these activities, are meeting and aligning with early care education providers are already doing. And many of these activities are just five or ten minute pieces that meet learning standards that can be incorporated into the routine and the rhythm of the day. So that's always how we recommend starting out, is finding ways to fit small pieces into the work that's already happening. Has the Cooking Matters program been involved in partnering with this project? Uh, great question and a wonderful potential partnership. And I have seen a couple of um, programs, particularly in Colorado, where early care education sites are providing Cooking Matters opportunities for parents um, and integrating the local foods opportunities with Cooking Matters. And that's another great resource and opportunity for early care education sites to take advantage of. Um, and another great partnership that can provide resources and educational tools and maximize that parent integration. Um, so we have seen some of that in states around the country. Great questions. This is so fun, everyone. Thanks so much for your wonderful questions. Um, let's see. I think we have some time left. Please feel free to put in um, your questions as they come. There we go. Did you plan to collect stories occurring as a result of the project, or did you have a structure to get those? So uh, our communications team and myself are constantly gathering stories and resources. A lot of those are cataloged and housed on our website through our blog, um, and then various, um, various pieces that we send out and stories. Uh, we're also doing some case study work. Uh, specifically around procurement, so identifying different early care and education sites and how they're purchasing local foods and integrating those into their programs. So we'll be releasing some case studies in partnership um, with one of our partners, and that's the Center for Regional Food Systems, in a few months here. And then we also have a program working with, excuse me, a project working with a couple of other partners, the PFC Social Impact Advisor Group and the BUILD um, Initiative in gathering case studies and stories to um, establish some best practices and identify uh, opportunities to overcome barriers for implementation of this work. So those case studies will also be released um, in the late fall and early winter. So we do have those kind of official story gathering pieces. And then we also have some of our um, less official story gathering that we scan on our website. And um, thinking about story gathering, one of the best times to do that is National Farm to School Month. And National Farm to School Month is coming up in October. So in October, we do a lot of work around identifying uh, where these great opportunities are. We do blogs multiple times a week to highlight the stories of successes. Um, and this week's, or excuse me, this year's theme is One Small Step. So this year, we're focusing on all of these small steps that programs can take to integrate local foods and food and farming education um, and, and learn more about farm to early care education and farm to school. So we're asking people to, and I'll put this information on Mighty Bell as well, uh, we're asking people to commit to signing a pledge to take one small step to integrate farm to school and farm to early care education into their work. And by signing that pledge, then they'll get all kinds of information and ideas about what those small steps can be um, and how it's benefiting kids that they're working with. Um, so and a big part of our Farm to School Month is that story gathering and learning about what all those individuals are doing. Um, so we do kind of have those multiple levels of story gathering built into our National Farm to School Network. Um, so we have a question about metrics. 
Um, so again, we are looking at the national national level. We're really looking at supporting and helping build capacity for programs. And so kind of one element of doing that is helping provide resources around evaluation. Um, and one of our key evaluation tools, and I can post this as well, I need to keep an ongoing list here, um, is the trans is the, um, evaluation for transformation, which is a framework for evaluation looking at multiple components of farm to school and farm to early care and education. So it has different resources and different um, metrics to assess these different uh, opportunities for impact from farm to school and farm to early care and education. So that includes public health, that includes education, and that includes environment. Um, so it looks at these multiple metrics to measure the impact on those different areas. Um, so it really depends on what you're looking to measure, um, you know, what you're looking to make impact on. I think that for farm to early care and education, most of the metrics look at um, kind of parent uh, perspective on how this is impacting their children is one of the common metrics. Um, a lot of them of the programs in Farm to Early Care and Education will do teacher surveys. Um, some of the more successful or more highly published and publicized work will directly measure children's um, opinions about food, their willingness to try, their willingness to like. Um, so those are some of the metrics that we're seeing now, but there is a lot of opportunity for kind of broader um, evaluation, but it is certainly challenging with young children. At the national level, we really look at our reach um, to look at kind of the success of our work. So the USDA Farm to School Survey, um, that's a great measure of the expansion and the opportunity in the Farm to School and Farm to Early Care and Education. So that's one metric that we use at the national level to kind of evaluate our effect and impact. Great questions. Um, it's such a pleasure to hear from all of you, and I hope it's been um, helpful information. Um, so one kind of item for conversation that I'd love to take a deep for you to consider, um, and this can maybe be an ongoing conversation on the Mighty Bell message board that we can continue discussion, um, or if anyone has input right now, I think it'd be really great to, to um, bring out as a group. But one of the greatest priorities in the National Farm to School Network is to ensure equitable access of these opportunities and ensure racial and social equity um, is a priority and prioritized at both our organizational and programmatic levels. So one thing I would love to hear from you and from your varied experience and um, knowledge bases is how we can better do that as a national level organization. Um, so our current approaches include staff education and professional development, um, realignment of our organizational priorities to ensure that equity is at the forefront of those. Um, at the programmatic level, we work to prioritize stories and examples from diverse communities um, and focus on development of culturally appropriate materials. Um, I think one of the challenges that we see at the national level is how to uh, provide the best support for our network in helping um, our network representatives work directly with communities uh, because we at the national level aren't necessarily doing that direct community-driven work. Um, so what kind of resources and information and support can we provide to help make this more feasible for our partners um, to better align and prioritize equity. Um, so I'd love to hear from your experiences, from your knowledge base, how we can ensure that equity is at the forefront of everything we do, even if we're not working directly with communities on a day-to-day -day basis. Feel free to unmute yourself and speak, or you can chat in. You don't have to wait for the chat to talk. It's a great comment here. It would be interesting to learn from communities that express interest but were unable to become engaged with farm-to-school 
and that's a great a great comment and something we're really of interest in. Um, our policy team recently partnered with the National Voices Project to do some research into interest around farm to early parent education and farm to school and barriers um, to, to investing and barriers to um, working in farm to school and farm to early parent education. So that information and those um, results will be coming out in the next few months. So that will be some great resources for us to build on to help overcome those barriers for communities that haven't been able to engage. Hmm. This is great. So thinking about ways to uplift the voices of those who may request or require a different approach. Um, and I think that is such a valuable comment and such a challenge. I think that we get very ingrained in this approach that we think is the best and we think is the most effective. And it's very hard to um, kind of modify our communication and modify the resources that we're creating to very specifically meet the needs of the community. Um, so that's really great feedback to think about as we're working on our communication and bringing in new partners and really identifying how um, we can support them and lift up their voices, even if it's not in a traditional way that we use. Another great comment um, from Renee. Thank you. Um, Renee's wondering about farmers that can't participate participate because they're unable to meet the regulatory requirements or it comes at too high a cost. Uh, what would be a communal approach to increasing access? And that is a great question and a huge issue. And one challenge we face with the National Farmers School Network is um, is getting farmers' voices involved and, and communicating with farmers and finding out their needs um, and finding out farmers' barriers and to providing foods to schools and early childhood education sites. And that is certainly a big barrier. Um, we continue, there are some uh, USDA supports for farmers to help meet those regulations and to expand opportunity uh, in new markets. So we do see an increasing interest from um, the federal levels and even state funding opportunities. But I think the key is really helping farmers access those. Um, you know, a farmer is expected to do five full-time jobs in one day. You know, he's expected to actually grow the food, that important part, but he'd be the marketing op operations officer, um, you know, be the, the promotional officer and the advertiser and the development staff. And, um, you know, the farmer is expected to do all these things and, and identifying opportunities to provide those supports and, and do education about those opportunities is really vital. Um, and there are some wonderful organizations, you know, young farmer organizations, um, or, or farmer organizations for farmers of color, um, great organizations across the country that are really work, working to increase that access. Um, and there are also some really creative endeavors, um, like there's one a program in Chicago, for instance, um, that is, is working to uh, provide grants to farmers to help them meet those regulatory needs and then connects them directly to the early care and education program so they have that built-in market once they utilize that grant to achieve those regulatory um, requirements. So we have some creative options coming both from kind of national level organizations utilizing federal funding and identifying ways to take opportunity with that and then those community-based approaches that are really working to uh, kind of capitalize on multiple access points um, and building that community of support for farmers. So great question and, and certainly a challenge um, you, um, engaging farmers and producers because they're working at, at a very different schedule and um, level. Great questions and great comments, really valuable. So if there aren't any more questions or comments, um, I want to thank you all for being here. And please feel free to reach out to me at any time. Um, and I'll certainly have a presence on Mighty Bell and post these for any follow-up thoughts. Um, and, and thank you so much, Renee and Kim, for hosting and um, having me here. It's such a pleasure to be a part of this community. Thank you so much, Lacey. This was so informative and enlightening. and we're, um, Really appreciative of everyone who participated, your great questions, your great engagement. And um, as I mentioned in the chat, this will be posted on Mighty Bell, and we can continue the conversation there, um, as I'm sure Lacey would be happy to share more about her work. So thank you all, and have a wonderful Tuesday afternoon. <laughs>